A man returning home is suddenly thrust into a world of true crime and conspiracy. And then we travel to your bedroom to take a look what's hidden behind that closet door. Is it really just a bunch of clothes? Is it a ghastly spirit? Or something far, far worse? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys had an awesome weekend. First off, let's give a shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Zach Yoga. Zach, everyone give a round of applause to Zach Yoga. Zach, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you can't support the Patreon, that's fine too. Just help spread the word about the show. Really, really helps out a lot. Now, Zach, I got to warn you. I got to warn, warn you, dude. It's always luck of the draw when people support the show. What episode they end up on. This episode's a little creepy. It's actually quite, quite creepy. So, I hope you're really good at yoga. I hope you're really good at de-stressing. And if you're not, um, if, if you have already had a bummy weekend and don't want any more bad news or creepy news, I, I guess I'm building it up. <laughs> the episode isn't about you and how crummy your life is. This episode's a little dark, though. And it ends with spooky things in your closet. It ends with a thin piece of wood separating you from eternal evil. So, you know... Zach doesn't have a choice. He has to be in this episode, but maybe it's not the right episode for your Monday. But Zach, I'm going to toss you the keys of the Jason Jalopy. We are headed out to Las Vegas, Nevada. Zach Yoga is all flexible. He's driving the car with his feet. Totally not hygienic, but, you know, he is a Patreon supporter. It's November 6th, 2020, so incredibly recent story. This just happened. We're driving through Las Vegas. In front of us is a car driven by Jaquan Singleton. Now, Jay Kwan was just leaving his grandma's house. His grandma was taking care of one of his children. And he was headed back home to a house he shares with his girlfriend, Amanda Sharp Jefferson, 26 years old, and their two daughters. Rose is one year old. Little Lily is two months old. As he's driving back to his house, he can't wait to see his kids. He can't wait to see his girlfriend, but things haven't been going well at the house recently. Now, not your typical domestic strife, fighting over bills and stuff like that. She accused him of cheating on her. Which, that's not abnormal, right? I mean, I'm not saying Jaquan gets accused of it all the time. It comes up in relationships, someone gets suspicious, things like that. But, no matter how much he denies that he's cheating on her, she says, you are in the spirit world. Your alter spirit wife is who you're cheating on me with. You see, there's a world right above our own. That's where you're going to cheat on me. Jay Kwan walks into his house, and Amanda's just sitting on the couch. He's just kind of walking in. The house is unusually quiet. He notices that Lily's bassinet is sitting there. But as he's walking up, dropping his keys, trying to get settled back into his house, he notices Lily and Rose are both in the bassinet. They're stacked on top of each other. So it's not like they're comfortably laying, taking a nap. They're completely prone, one on top of the other. Obviously, Jay Kwan doesn't... His, his brain's trying to catch up to this situation of what he's seeing. He sees both of his daughters perfectly still in a bassinet, just laying on top of each other. He turns to Amanda and goes, w- w- What's going on? Shh! Amanda shushes him from the couch. Amanda, w- what happened to my daughter? Shh! He reaches down and touches his daughter's bodies. They're cold. He goes to call the police. Amanda's trying to keep him from calling the police. Telling him, no, 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 no. Don't call the police. Don't call the police. Do you know how much their organs are worth? She begins to talk about how much the daughter's organs are worth. As he's looking for his phone to call an ambulance, call the police, to call anybody. She begins talking about how much money they can get for their organs. When rescue personnel got to the house, they overheard her talking about selling the organs. She got arrested, obviously. She got arrested. And then the story gets even more bizarre. When the cops take her into custody, they ask her, so tell us what happened here. And she goes, I don't know. And they go, 
Ma'am, we know that you murdered your two daughters. Just tell us what happened. You'll get that weight off your chest. People want to confess. And she looked at them and said, I don't have any daughters. I don't know who that man was who walked into my apartment. I live alone. Never seen him before. Police kind of look at each other. Her story is that basically she's from an alternate reality. She said that she's been living in her apartment alone all this time. And then one day she walked into her living room and there were two bodies in a bassinet. Now that story, okay, so I'm leaving some stuff out. That story in and of itself, <laughs> because let me just say, that story in and of itself is, is very disturbing. It's very, there's for, for multiple reasons. One, I can't imagine what that father's going through and all the family's going through. To think that um, somebody that you loved and had kids with killed those kids. That's the, wor- I, that's the worst crime. Like, killing your parents, it's pretty bad. Like, if I had to rate them, if I had to rate a family side, killing your parents, it's like, uh, you know, at a certain point, you know, I'm not saying all kids are destined to kill their parents, but that's actually, isn't that part of the monomyth? Like, first you kill your parents, then you kill your teacher, then you kill God. That's kind of like the evolution of man. I'm not saying literally, I'm not saying start banging on the gates of heaven or kill your parents. Don't start on that first step, but like fighting your parents, whatever. <laughs> I guess there's a difference between fighting and killing them, but don't kill your parents. That's not what I'm saying. But if someone told me that they killed their parents, I'd be like, what did they do to deserve it? And hopefully there was a good answer. Hopefully it wasn't asking questions like, what did they do to deserve it? Siblings killing each other, it's pretty rough, right? A little more, it's a little more understandable. Again, not advocating it. I'm saying on the list of killing, like, if I had to rank them, if I had to rank them, killing your kids would be the worst, is what I'm trying to say. That was all leading up. Killing your kids would be the worst because you're that guardian. You're that person who's taking care of them, who created them. And then, but you know, like siblings killing each other, it's still horrible. And then you killing your parents, it's still horrible. Don't get me, don't, this is not, I'm not starting an advocacy group. But there's something just so despicable about killing your own children. And then the things that that father must be going through is absolutely awful. So we have that. We just have the sheer circumstances of it. When we look at it through a paranormal lens, we look at it, though, what if this would explain... Let's put on our conspiracy caps here for a second. What if this would explain why people are caught at crime scenes or people 100% believe they're guilty? There's a bunch of evidence leading them to be guilty, but... They're not guilty, like they're actually found not guilty, or 20 years later, evidence comes out that shows they're not guilty. It's because they actually came from an alternate universe. Now, hear me out, hear me out. (laughs) Or or not, or totally dismiss me. But my point is, is that what if, like, let's say O.J. Simpson, for example, right? (laughs) That's immediately like, that's a terrible example. Let's say O.J. Simpson, for example. Let's say that he, the uh, the O.J. of Universe Prime, that's our universe, because we're the best universe. O.J. Simpson of Universe Prime did murder Nicole Brown and uh, what was Goldman? Uh, I don't remember his first name, but O.J. Simpson of Universe Prime killed Brown and Goldman and then (laughs) just disappeared, then just fell through a wormhole and a you would be indistinguishable. The O.J. Simpson from Universe 897 came through that same portal and was like out out of the crime scene. He's just standing there. He's like, "Uh uh-oh. And then, uh, but he's found not guilty because let's say he didn't appear at the crime scene. Let's say, like, say he appeared at a boutique or something like that. Then he was nowhere near there. And that way he'd have the alibi, but the cops could go, we found all this evidence. Half of it we manufactured, but there's evidence here. Or there's people that you know, the cops know are absolutely guilty, but their DNA is different. And they get set free. Like, the cops are like, we know that was the guy. We have all this evidence. Maybe not DNA evidence, because that can fix a lot of people. But they go, we found this same type of fiber in his car, and da 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 And the jury's like, nope, they're not guilty. What if you, so, so what if your DNA is different in another universe? So if Jason from Universe Prime, this one, interacted with Jason from Universe 1257... Would we have the same... I don't know how we're interacting. We're playing ping pong and throwing skin flakes everywhere. Would our DNA be the same? It's creepy. And again, the crime itself is absolutely inhumane. I don't want to minimize that. But again, with our conspiracy caps on, paranormal view of looking at this, she sees this alternate reality 
and she may have slipped in. She's she, this basically the uh, Amanda in Universe Prime here. She did. She wasn't married in this other universe, and she's walking around this apartment, and she's like, "Oh my god." Like, there's, I don't know who these children are, but um, they're dead. I don't know what's going on. That story is creepy. Now, I did, did leave out some key details um, because it totally would have ruined that ending. She did, she does say that. She does 100% say that she just, she just not married to this guy. She doesn't know who these kids are. She walked into her house one day and she found these two lifeless kids in her bassinet. The stuff I left out is after she saw that, she went to take a shower and then went and sat on the couch. And the cops are like, if your story's true, why did you take a shower? So that kind of throws a little, I don't want to say water, because then that's a pun. But that throws a little bit of, you know, milk in the honey on that one. Because if you walked in your house, if you did come from an alternate reality and walked home and there was a crime scene there, you want to be like, oh, I can't do anything about that. Time to take a shower. Obviously, you would call the police. Also, what's totally, she could probably argue probably argue an insanity defense and they could say yeah you know which is really hard to win on but she could they could say yeah she thought that she'd come from an alternate reality and that would be a it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a great defense you'd lose but she didn't even stick to that story because as the cops are investigating her and she's saying i don't know who those kids are i don't know who this guy is i just came home and found these bodies as the cops are investigating her she goes hey you guys are in law enforcement right they're like yeah yeah we are and she goes, do you know how much I can sell their organs for? Cops are like, what? So even then, like, even if she did come from an alternate reality, for some reason she wants to sell people's organs. She said she saw it in a movie. She said she saw a movie where she found out organs were expensive. So isn't that creepy? It's funny, the other day I was talking to Palm Pomeron on Twitter. Palm posted a survey about uh, who's hotter or who'd want to date or something like that. And it was Shigo from Kim Possible. And then it was some girl from Danny Phantom. I actually might cover this coming up, but Pom Pomeron reminded me of this. There was this guy who doesn't like buttholes. He hated buttholes. And he was in love with Danny Phantom. Not Danny Phantom himself, but the girls from Danny Phantom. And he would draw pictures of himself in the world of Danny Phantom. And he hated buttholes so much he shot up a grocery store and then killed himself. Because he thought once he died, he'd go into a world full of no one would have a butthole and everyone would be from Danny Phantom. So I might do a whole episode on that. I think he has a manifesto. If I can find his manifesto, I'd love to d dive into that. I've always loved doing that on the show. I've only done it once. But I read the manifesto. Again, I think he has one. If he did, I read it years ago. I love uh, reading stuff like that. And, um, yeah, but anyways, the point is, is that it's crazy to think, and that's probably a poor choice of words, but it's crazy to think, I'm just going to do it again, it's crazy to think that you can have someone who's already teetering on insanity, and then they watch the wrong show, and it fully cements that insane worldview. Like, had the guy who was shooting, I'll put it in the show notes, I'll put it in the show notes, if you can't wait for my episode on it, it'll probably be next week, but... If that guy had not seen Danny Phantom, if he instead watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, would he have tried to focus his energy into being a superhero? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I guess anything would be better. It'd be better if he just watched Dragnet and just decided to be a cop or just watched nothing, decided not to be crazy. But it's creepy to think this woman watched a movie, watched some random movie where someone was saying, oh, you know how much money we can get for these organs? And that was the key that unlocked this horrific, horrible plan. Kyle Yoga, you ready to take us out of here? He's he's nodding his head enthusiastically. Yeah, I know it's a grim story. It's especially a grim story for a Monday. But tomorrow's episode has something even grosser. It's maybe not as grim, but it's way grosser. So I feel bad for the Patreon. The guy who supported the Patreon for tomorrow. Uh, Zach, going to have a good laugh at that one. Zach, go ahead and call in that Carpenter Copter. We are leaving behind Las Vegas, Nevada, and we are headed out to Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> Rainstorm, <laughs> lightning and thunder. Kyle is perfectly cut. Zach, I think I called you Kyle a second ago. <laughs> I think I called you Kyle a second ago, so if I add in Zach, Zach will edit those up. And Zach is flying us expertly through this rainstorm. We're headed to Tulsa, Oklahoma to meet a young girl 
named Melissa. <laughs> Helicopter lands. Uh, we're running out on our raincoat. You run a raincoat, right? You're like, I didn't know it was going to storm this episode. We run and we pick the lock and now we're in Melissa's house. She didn't invite us. She doesn't know the story's going on. Melissa H. was living with her dad in this house in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she had heard stories that it was haunted. She got a feeling that it was haunted. It was just one of those creepy places. And she did what I consider one of the most unforgivable sins. I hate doing it. I do it if I'm too lazy to get up. She sleeps with the closet door open. It's not her cat. It's not her cat trying to get in her bed. That's the door slowly swaying back and forth. She probably should get that checked out. Doors aren't supposed to do that. But anyways, she wakes up one night. Her room is pitch black. In the closet, though, she sees someone standing there. No, someone hanging there. Who she describes in her closet is a teenage girl wearing a white wedding dress. This figure in the closet, her whole body is spasming. (laughs) Every muscle, every joint, every limb, looking like it's the middle of some sort of musculature fit. Melissa is sitting in bed, and she's too scared to scream. She's just looking at this specter twitching in the darkness of her closet. She jumps out of bed, and she has to walk by her closet. Poorly designed. Poorly designed bedroom. She jumps out of bed, and she has to walk by her closet to get out of the room. The whole time, she has her eyes on the ghost. Even as she's reaching back to turn the knob to get out, she can't stop looking at the girl. The whole time, this teenage girl in the closet, her her entire body is convulsing. (laughs) The whole time, she's staring straight into Melissa's eyes. Here's another one. We (laughs) that wasn't bad enough, right? You're like, oh, that wasn't too scary. Here's another one. Zach. Let's hop back in that carpenter copter. We are headed out to actually I don't have a location of this one. We'll just say this one's across the street. It's a really, really haunted neighborhood. So uh, we get in the carpenter copter, we fly, we fly 30 feet, we land. We're now at the house of another young girl. Let's call this one Rebecca, because we don't have a name. This story actually came from Mysterious Universe. They got it from True Ghost Tales. Rebecca is sitting on the couch watching TV with her mom. And all of a sudden, oh, help, no, oh, oh, they hear screaming. They recognize the screaming, it's her father. So they jump up. Now, their dad is an alcoholic, so apparently he screams all the time. So there's that. It wasn't like they were like, oh no, right away. But as it continued on, they're like, okay, we should probably go check on him. It's a commercial break on the show. Let's go check on him. No! They don't know where the screaming's coming from, so they're kind of walking around the house. Probably taking their time, honestly. They're like, dad, where are you? Eventually, they trace the screaming into Rebecca's bedroom. Then they trace the screaming into Rebecca's closet. They hear the sound of her father screaming on the other side of this closet door. Now, even though he's an alcoholic, not all alcoholics scream. I don't know if that's a stereotype that I've just invented, but there's a difference between running through the house or just sitting there and getting mad at the game and throwing stuff around. It's not great behavior either. Versus being in a closet screaming. It's definitely more creepy. They go to open the closet door. Rattle, rattle, rattle. Rattle, rattle, rattle. The knob won't turn. The door is stuck. The mom's using all of her weight. She finally uh, opens the door. And there in the closet is their father, which is what they expected. They didn't expect the rest of this paragraph. He was floating in midair. Hanging, it seemed, by his neck. For a few seconds. This doesn't go by. It's not like a flash. It's not like he jumped up right before they opened the door and he's all, ta-da! For a few seconds, they're actually looking at this adult man hover in the air like he's being hung or held up by something. Finally, he falls to the ground. He scrambles to his feet. Get out of the way, women! And he runs out of the bedroom to hide in another corner of the house. Now, the daughter and the mom go to follow him. And they're like, what what was that? That's not what we expected. We were watching Charles in Charge, and we got this instead. He said what happened was he was walking through the house. He was thinking, hmm, what am I going to scream about tonight? I'm just the right amount of drunk. I need to start my screaming soon. It's almost 7 p.m. 
He's walking through the house. He's walking through the house. He walks into Rebecca's room. And he watches the closet door open. He said he heard something begin to call his name. I didn't make up a name for him. So (laughs) the thing is going, Dad. Daddy. Papa. Papa, come here. It kind of stuns him for a second because he didn't expect to hear that. He also didn't expect the closet to call him Daddy. He's like, dude, my name's Robert. The next thing he knows, a dark figure darted out of the closet. And then he blacked out. Next thing he knows, the closet door is opening up. His family's looking at him, stunned. A few days later, Rebecca's sitting on the couch. I don't know why they haven't moved at this point, right? Rebecca's sitting on the couch. And she said the whole light was on, and it was the way the house was structured was that you could look down the hallway, which is one of the creepiest things possible <laughs> ever looking down the hallway. You could look down the hallway and see into her bedroom. And she said, she looked down the hallway, and the whole the hallway light was on, the whole place was lit up. She says her parents were only about 10 feet away from her in this story, so I don't know if that means they were in a separate room, or if they were in the same room just 10 feet away. I don't know how small this house was. She said her parents were only about 10 feet away. She sees, like in a flash, a dark figure standing in her bedroom doorway. It reaches its arm out and begins to beckon her to him. She opens her mouth to scream, nothing comes out. It's interesting because that happened to Melissa as well. She starts to scream. She's trying to scream, but nothing will come out. She turns her head looking for some sort of help. And when she turns back, the figure is right next to her. It's sitting on the couch. She feels a hand wrap around her neck. This demon kisses her forehead, kisses her neck, disappears. Rebecca said her family had not seen the thing since. They had never seen it again. But she does say whenever she's in a dark room, she feels like she's not alone. So, super spooky story, obviously. I did leave, I left something out of that story as well, though, because I don't, I don't know if this adds to the spookiness or if it makes you kind of roll your eyes, but I didn't, I didn't want to ruin the narrative, but I did want to include it. So the next day, in between those two events, right? Here's a little prequel for you. Here's a little prequel for you. Or, uh, <sighs> Jason, why'd you ruin that story? The next day, so first time the dad's being hung, the third time it jumps out, This is the jump scare, real life jump scare on the couch. But in between the two events, the next morning after the dad was hanging in the closet, they went into her room and they opened the closet door. And inside... And inside... And inside... And inside was a... Was a vampire. Was a vampire. So I... I left that part out because it's so dumb. It totally ruins the story. This is what they next day they these are my notes. Next day they checked out the closet. They saw a man standing in there, his hands over his chest like Dracula when he sleeps. He had long fingernails and he had wings, and uh, he was sleeping because it was daytime. It was the next day, and then they closed the closet door. Like, what do you do after that? Anyways, that's dumb. That part makes it dumb. Totally ruins the story, right? Anyways, forget about you <laughs> shut the door on that part of the story as well. Totally ruins it. The reason why I wanted to cover this is because closets are super, super spooky, but I didn't want to end it with just telling you some spooky stories <laughs> one that involves a movie vampire. I want to suck your blood. That was the part that she cut out because even she knew that was ridiculous. The question isn't, are closets scary? They are scary. I'm sure one or two of you guys will be like, what closets aren't scary? I work at a closet repair shop and I've never seen a ghost. And you're actually a ghost. You didn't know that. You've been a ghost for 100 years. But for the most part, most rational people think closets are scary. So I wanted to tell a couple scary ghost stories involving closets. But then I wanted to talk about why are closets spooky? I actually looked into the science behind closets being spooky. It's interesting. I didn't find I didn't find any science on it at all. But I did find a website called Magic for the Real World. And so it's like the reverse of science. Magic is the reverse of science. So th- this counts as scientific. There's been a lot of studies on doors. That's actually true. I'll see if I can find it for the show notes. But there was a study a long time ago that when you know how when you walk through a door and you forget what you were trying to do, you're like, what was I going to do? What was I going to do? Oh, yeah, I was going to hide in this closet and be a vampire. You walk through a door. You go to get your keys. You forget what you're in there for. You can't figure it out. You're like, why am I in this room? All that stuff. 
They've actually done studies on that, of why that happens. The answer is they don't know. <laughs> the scientists don't know. But what's weird is they can actually do it virtually. They said you can set someone up at a computer, and if they press a button and a virtual door opens, it actually degrades their memory. There is something about passing through thresholds that makes people forget why they are in there. That doesn't make sense at all. Did cavemen do it when they were walking into a cave? They're like, oh, me, Og, me, no, no, why I'm here. And they're like, dude, we only have three things. We have a club, we have saber-toothed tiger meat, and then we have uh, this chalk to write on a cave. He's like, me still not know. At, w- at what point, if I'm walking through a forest and there are two trees, their branches come over and make an arc, or an arch, however you pronounce it, and I walk through those while I forget why I'm in the forest. So at, w- at what point is a doorway a doorway? Like, does it actually, it doesn't actually have to have a door, because in the VR, you can do it. So, at what point, like, if I crawled through a hole, if I was crawling through a tunnel, would I keep forgetting why I'm in there? Like, why am I in here? Why am I in here? Why am I in here? Every foot. Like, at what point is a doorway a doorway? So, that's weird. That's just a weird scientific thing, and a big philosophical question as well. If you cut a hole in the wall and crawl through it, is that a doorway? Technically, it's an area of transition, But if you took the forest, that example, or if you had like a broken down gazebo, it's just one side, it's just one side, and you walk through the gazebo. I don't need to keep making examples. You guys get it. At what point is a door not a door? Because otherwise, you shouldn't have any doors at all or any archways and nothing. Submarines, submarines just have to, they're basically boats. You can't have little hatches on them. That's the last thing you want someone climbing in a hatch and they're like, what am I doing on here? They're like, look out! Torpedoes are hitting them. But... My point being is those are that's weird. Just the idea of doors is super spooky. But uh, back to reality, Magic for the Real World website, they say that an area of transition is actually exactly what it sounds like. You're moving from one room to another. But any time you have an area of transition, it's not just for us. That doorway you built also allows anything else to transition through that doorway. See, th- that would make sense about, like, haunted woods. Because you'd have ponds. That would basically be a transition spot between the earth and the water. Archways and trees. Groves. Circles of rocks. All of these would be transitional areas. Any area of transitions can allow these creatures to come through. Magic for the real world had a pretty simple solution for this. What you need to do is you need to remove as many transitional areas as possible, which is, unless you live in a yurt, is impossible. Because, again, even if you removed your door, you still got to walk through it. <laughs> they're, not, they're not requiring you to remove your doors, but they are saying to limit them as much as possible. They said, rearrange furniture to minimize shadows. So there's that. Um, or you could just change your light bulbs. Or I have no light bulbs at all. <laughs> I mean, again, I guess I'm taking it to the most drastic extreme. They're just saying, move your couch. And I'm like, burn down the foundation. Uh, move your furniture around so there's less shadows. They also said this, and I think this is the worst advice ever. Leave your closet light on. Now, I think that's a bad advice for two reasons. One, most closets don't have lights. But let's say that you went out and got a light bulb for your closet. I think it's creepier. Honestly, I hate this. This is one of the things I hate. When I'm laying down to go to bed, if I leave a light on in another room, which I'll do for different reasons. I've, I, have my, I have my reasons. I leave a light on in the other room. I'm going to bed. And I can see that thin strip of light. I'm always worried I'm going to look and I'm going to see feet standing there. And you're like, <laughs> you're like Jason. So you're, so you're saying there is an off chance that one time... You may look over and see feet standing outside your door because the light there. But the alternative is to have monsters. Giant monsters floating around in the darkness waiting for you. Monsters that look like Universal Pictures vampires. That's your choice is a pair of boots. A pair of boots outside your bedroom door or some sort of hellish monster. Yeah, but I don't see that. I don't see the monster. Plus, I think if I was a ghost, it'd be a lot easier to just manifest my feet. So if I wanted to scare myself, I would just be feet. I mean, that'd be terrifying anyways, right? You're sitting there eating lunch, you just see feet sitting on your table. Seeing a full body, like, standing there would be super scary, but I'm imagining that it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot lot of spiritual work to get your body in shape. So 
you could either manifest your entire body after maybe 100 years, or you could just be feet today. Be feet today. And if you could just easily be feet, then you could just appear outside my door. But as you get ready for bed tonight, make sure that your closet door is locked, possibly barricaded shut. Make sure that your feet aren't hanging off the bed and the blanket covers you from toe to neck. And just keep an eye on that old rickety closet door. You might think that with it locked, there's no chance of anything getting out to hurt you. But is it really possible for two inches of wood to hold back the might of a dark spirit? We tell ourselves that these things will protect us so we can get a good night's sleep. But in the end, that door opens. And while you have a restless sleep, it stands over you and watches. It's just waiting for the right moment to make you disappear from the world of the living. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. <laughs>